Hello, and welcome to Grand Street Rounds. I'm your host, Dr. Carly McMillan, and I'm the CEO and founder of Brooklyn Minds. We're a comprehensive mental health center based in New York City. We specialize in treating patients as a team for whom more traditional psychiatric help, such as the heavy use of frequent hospitalizations and crisis emergency room visits, has often been counterproductive. Grand Rounds, for those who don't work in medicine, originated as part of residency training to share new information. Grand Rounds help keep people up to date on bigger picture ideas that may be out of someone else's area of expertise. Grand Street, for those who haven't visited our Williamsburg flagship office, is our first permanent home, so we're proud to bring you our very own Grand Street Rounds. Today, we welcome our clinical and school psychologist, Dr. Jessica Rossi Saidi, to speak on heading back to school during a pandemic. We cannot make COVID disappear. There's a lot we can do to cope and support learning in spite of it. As a mom of preschool twins, I'm particularly interested to hear her talk. Dr. Rossi previously worked at Columbia University Medical Center providing outpatient services as well as working in multiple school-based settings across the New York City area. She uses evidence-based approaches with a particular interest in anxiety, trauma, school refusal, and behavior disorders. She is able to provide consultation to children, adults, families, and even to schools directly. Before we begin, just a reminder, the content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your mental health professional or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding your condition. Following Dr. Rossi's presentation, we'll have a question answer time, and I would encourage you to submit your questions and comments to us directly or in the chat. All right, welcome. Let's get started, and thanks for being here. Um, Dr. Rossi, Zoom is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. All right, so I'm going to share my screen and start my presentation. Okay, so welcome. Um, today I'm going to be talking about back to school during a pandemic, strategies to support learning and coping. Um, I know as introduced, um, I'm going to be doing the presentation today. Again, I'm a clinical and school psychologist. Um, and I think that my experiences both in clinical outpatient settings as well as in schools across New York City have really uniquely prepared uh, me to talk about this transition to distance learning in some cases and how the pandemic has impacted learning and education um, as a whole. So I think it's really important that we discuss what we're gonna be talking about today as far as what I will be reviewing. And again, at the end, there will be a Q&A. So feel free to add any questions that you have. Um, they can be related to the topic or just questions in general. But uh, the plan today is to talk about the pandemic impact. Um, I'm specifically gonna talk about executive function and emotion regulation. And I'll go into exactly what those uh, skills are and how they impact children. I'm then going to speak about some strategies to support learning and coping, and then also going to give you some resources and where to continue the, your learning. Um, I recognize this is a short presentation and want to be able to give you more materials to continue um, to gain more information. So we're going to start with the pandemic impact. So I think it's really important to think about um, how a child functions, and I think a really great, great way to look at this, and this is for children, adolescents, adults, is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, so this is a motivational theory, and basically our lower needs need to be met, so lower on the pyramid in order to reach the higher levels. So the base really focuses on our basic needs, then goes to psychological needs, and then goes to like full self-fulfillment. Um, so the bottom rung is the physiological, so that is our, you know, eating, sleeping, um, drinking, sort of our basic needs. Um, and also above that, you can see is safety, so that's just like security, that could be having a place to stay, um, having enough financial means to do well. And then the premise of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is that in order to get to these higher levels, so our psychological needs or our full potential, we really need to have those base needs met. Um, the psychological needs are love and belongingness, um, self-esteem, and then the top of the pyramid is really um, that self-fulfillment or self-actualization, the highest level. So basically everything is being met so we can meet our full potential. And usually it's more aspirational. Um, but I think this pyramid really sets a great stage for how do we meet our, our children's needs and 
I think with the pandemic, that idea of, you know, physiologically and safety and also that connectedness with others has been impacted. Um, so I think while the pandemic may have, have has changed over time and there is maybe this new normal, there's a lot of things that are changing all the time and whether they're positive or negative changes, they still can impact um, a child's ability to um, feel safe or feel like they belong. Um, and so I think that's really important to sort of frame our conversation and our thinking um, because if those basic needs aren't met, we're not able to get to those higher levels of functioning and being able to reach our full potential both in a school and social settings. Um, and then I also want to speak to as a parent or a teacher or provider, you know, generally best practices include a warm but firm approach and having that structure. Um, and the pandemic has impacted a lot of us in many different ways, whether that is a change in our job status, um, different stress on the family, just having your children at home while you're learn while they're learning. Um, so while things may have been going okay before the pandemic, this is a huge stressor. And we have to recognize that that's going to impact how we parent, how we teach, how we work as providers, and trying to take care of ourselves so that we can, in turn, take care of um, the children and adolescents that we, that we have or work with. Um, so I just wanted to frame the conversation around that um, and, and thinking of how there's been so many different changes, so many different um, changes in boundaries um, because of the quick changes and um, while you may know and be able to do what's best for your child in that moment with the pandemic, you know, that's all changed. Um, and so that's just something to keep in the back of our mind as we talk about these more specific skills and thinking about, um, is this child's physiological and safety needs being met? And where can we go from there? So today I'm going to talk in detail about executive function and emotion regulation. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about each of those ideas, but I just wanted to frame sort of why are these so important. So executive functions and emotion regulation play a fundamental role during child development, contributing to and predicting the development of cognitive abilities, academic achievements, and developmental disorders. So I really wanted to frame why is this important? So our cognitive abilities are our thinking abilities and how we process information. Academic achievement is more the typical reading, writing, math abilities, and then developmental disorders. So things that can impact how a child functions. Um, so I feel like executive function and emotion regulation are really important. And regardless of the pandemic, these are skills that need to be addressed and fostered. Um, and again, I'm going to explain in more detail what, what these actually mean. So what is executive function? So they're processes required for goal-directed self-control and mental flexibility. Um, there's a lot of different ways people describe executive function, um, but generally there's some agreement that there's three main categories. Um, so there's working memory, which is our ability to retain and manipulate pieces of information um, over time. So a quick example of this is auditory working memory. So if someone says a phone number to us, can we hold that information in our mind and then can we repeat that? Um, so working memory is one of those, but there's a lot of different types of working memory. Um, mental flexibility, that's our ability to sustain um, and, sh and or shift attention in response to demands or different environments we're in. Um, so being able to recognize what's our environment and then also shift what we're doing in that moment. And then the last construct typically in executive function is self-control. Um, and this enables us to set priorities and resist impulses or actions or responses. Um, so those are the three categories within executive function. It's a pretty large construct, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what that looks like and how that works in children's minds, um, as well as you know, adults. So when we, be when we think about executive function, it begins shortly after birth, and it continues to grow through adolescence and early adulthood. Um, so, you really have to be into your mid-20s for it to be set, meaning 
um, reaching your full potential with the executive function. I would say between ages three and six, that's a big growth period for executive function skills. Um, and then after that, it still continues into our mid 20s. Um, for some children, um, it could be delayed that area of growth if there's other things that are going on or happening. Um, so regardless of that growth spurt, it's really important to support children um, and, you know, until your mid 20s, uh, executive functioning is still developing. Um, and I'm going to get more into it more later about how do we support that? Because um, it is pretty complex. It involves a lot of different pieces as well. Okay, so I think that this quote really speaks to what executive functioning looks like in the brain. Um, so having executive function in the brain is like having an air traffic control system at a busy airport to manage the arrivals and departures of dozens of planes on multiple runways. Um, so <laughs> to say it's just very complicated, it's not so easy. Um, there's multiple things happening at the same time. Um, and it's really complicated. And I think an important thing to think about is kids don't have all the tools to do this yet and they need support in being able to provide these skills. So if you think about an air traffic control system, there's a lot of different input and data that goes into it in order for it to be successful. Um, so a child may have some of these pieces like managing things coming in, but a difficulty with getting things out. There's a lot of different parts of executive function and it doesn't typically develop evenly. Um, there's all different things that develop over time and everybody's different. So different things develop over time and kids may need different supports at different times with their executive functioning skills. Um, and executive functioning skills are really important to learning. Um, because there's so much information coming in and what we do with that information, how we store it in our brain, how we control our impulses really impacts how we do academically. Um, so I just wanted to highlight just how complicated and how many processes are involved in this idea of executive functioning um, so that we understand the importance of it and also to talk and speak to how can we support that. So next I'm gonna shift gears and talk a little bit more about emotion regulation. So I started with executive function and now I'm switching over to emotion regulation. Um, so the general premise of emotion regulation is that it involves managing one's own emotions in an adaptive, socially appropriate way. So I kind of wanna break that down. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to manage your, your emotions. Um, and they have to be adaptive and socially appropriate. So there's different times through the lifespan um, that things may be adaptive or socially appropriate. So it's important to think about um, where that child is and what is adaptive or socially appropriate, um, but it can be very complicated. And we can't tell by a child's age or what they are doing, sort of what their emotion regulation looks like. Um, and I have this graphic here just to highlight that, you know kids will have different levels of ability to regulate emotions and it also can be different for different emotions. So there sometimes can be over-regulation or there could be under-regulation. Um, it can definitely be complicated. Um, and it requires an awareness and understanding of feelings and involves coping strategies and tolerating or managing of internal distress. Um, so a lot of times with kids, they're able to find coping skills to maybe deal with things in the moment, but over time it gets more and more difficult or they have more and more stressors. Um, and this can happen for adults too. It's, this, this happens with adults as well as kids and um, it can get quite complicated. And especially if there are any challenges, that if a child's having difficulty understanding emotion, labeling emotion, um, knowing what they can do to help in that moment, it can be really tricky and can lead to a child being dysregulated. Um, and then when you're in that dysregulated state, you're not really able to accept feedback or input from your environment, whether that's from a 
teacher or from a parent. Um, so learning these skills is, is critical um, to being able to manage things in the moment and then ultimately learn. So all children and adolescents require support to develop executive function and emotion regulation skills. I think this is um, maybe a, a simple point, but it's very, very important. Um, children aren't bored with these abilities. There's a lot of different things that need to happen and supports that need to be in place in order for executive function skills and emotion regulation skills to develop. Um, so of course there is a hereditary component and biological component. So you, your child or a child may be more likely to have difficulty with emotion regulation or executive function. That's definitely possible. Um, and the environment's also very important. And so what we're gonna focus on today is more the environmental components and what we're gonna target because we can't control that heritability or that um, biological component of um, how a child is, but we can really control and or understand or support the environment around the child. So I'm going to focus in four different areas today, um, specifically, again, around executive functioning and emotion regulation and the strategies to support learning and coping. Um, so I'm going to go into more detail about the learning environment. Um, and I'm going to speak to how this will look, you know, remote learning as well as kids doing a combination of both and how we can support the learning environment. I'm also going to speak in detail about routines. Um, also going to speak about modeling, so showing behavior um, and modeling what you want your child to do. Um, and then more explicit skill building. Um, and so that's teaching the skills um, if, they, if the child hasn't acquired them yet or needs support with them. And I think to frame this conversation, um, you know, I could give you a million different strategies and uh, you could try them and they may work, they may not work. But I think uh, one key area to think about is where is this child and what can they do and what can't they do? Um, and I think a really great way to speak about this is the zone of proximal development. So this applies across the lifespan. So everyone has skills they can do on their own and skills they can achieve with guidance from a parent, teacher, or provider. So we must always ask, is this something that is in the zone of proximal development for this child? Um, so I'm gonna point you over to this graphic over here on my screen. Um, so on the left side, there is the level of challenge from low to high. And along the bottom, there's the level of competence, so low to high on this side. And so in the green area, these are tasks that the learner can complete without assistance. Um, and then the top left corner in the red are the tasks that the learner cannot yet complete even with assistance. And what we have in the middle is the sweet spot called the zone of proximal development. And these are tasks the learner can complete with appropriate assistance. So it's always important to think, is this something the child can do on their own? Can they do it with support? Um, or can they not even do it with support? You know, there's a spectrum. And so it's always, it's something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, so one example I think that can relate to school that that's easier to sort of understand is this idea of reading. So of course, every child's different, but let's just think of, you know, maybe a child in the first grade and we want them to be able to read a sentence. Um, so for one child, they may be able to complete this without any assistance. Um, we may have another child that this is in their zone of proximal development, so they can read the sentence with appropriate scaffolds or supports. Um, so this may be the teacher reminding them to point to each word as if they read. And you know, there may be first graders that without support, they cannot even complete this. And this may be you know, a child or student that um, 
is having difficulty with understanding letters. You know, they're not able to interpret letters or they're having a difficulty with reading. Um, so it's really important to think, where is this child as far as their zone of proximal development? Um, I think a very topical uh, discussion related to the pandemic is logging on to the computer on time for a class. So of course, um, all schools are doing things differently, but sometimes there is synchronous learning, um, sometimes asynchronous, um, but with synchronous learning, you know, it's important that the child logs on at the right time and joins class on time and engages during class. Um, so let's think about, you know, a high school student. There's some students that, you know, they just have a calendar on their phone, they get a reminder and they're able to do this on their own. They can complete it without assistance. And then we may have, you know, a teenager that they can't complete maybe even with assistance or they're needing that assistance. So one example might be that a child needs a reminder from their parent uh, in the morning and then they get a text reminder five minutes before to join. Um, so it's always sort of thinking through what's going on, is this something that the child can do with appropriate assistance? And sometimes there are things that even with assistance, they're not able to do. Um, and if we continue to try things over and over again and they're not working, I think this is a good place to come back to. Um, and the zone of proximal development is often used in learning and in schools and it really a key word that comes to mind when I think of zones of proximal development is scaffolds and if you think of scaffolding outside of a building it is the supports in order to get to build something into the next level so as a teacher or as a parent we can be that person that provides those scaffolds or supports in order for them to be successful in learning new tasks so we can get the task with assistance and then ultimately they can do it without assistance and, and it's a process. Um, it sounds easy, you know, easy enough, but it's complicated because kids learn at all different rates and have all different abilities. Um, but I think this is something important to keep in mind uh, when you are thinking about how to support a child or adolescent. So first I'm gonna speak to the learning environment. Um, so with the pandemic, of course, there was a shift to a lot of schools doing um, a variety of learning, learning techniques and tools. So some were doing uh, synchronous learning. So, um, you know, kids logging in and learning at the same time, this asynchronous learning where they're presented materials and have to complete it. Um, there's also now, depending where you are, um, you know, some students may be going in part of the time, some students may be um, staying home. There's a, a, all different options and a variety of options. And I would say that um, the, these, these key components will help regardless of if your child is full-time at home or in, or in school or a combination. Um, and a lot of these tools I use when uh, parents may be having a difficult time getting their child to complete homework. And now that with the pandemic, there is that blurred line between home and school. And we, we, we really can support our children by trying to set up their learning environment um, in a way for them to be successful and for it to be different than home. Even though it's in the home, we need to set up an environment for it to be focused on learning. So there's three key pieces. Um, that I'm going to speak to about the learning environment. So there's physical space essentials. So having a special area or desk for your child to complete their work is really important. Um, you know, even if you have several children, they all could be learning at the same time. If there's a table that they're doing their work at or a certain area, um, this can be really, really helpful to have designated areas um, for each child um, and just knowing where school is and where home is. Um, because again, the boundary is blurred. So I think it's really important to think about a space in your home, a desk, a table, an area of a table that can be designated for um, 
this distance or online learning. Um, again, flexibility is important, but I think at least having a designated space can be really, really helpful. Um, having a comfortable chair uh, for, for your child. Not everyone has, you know, a whole setup at home because they weren't planning for their child to be at home learning all the time. So thinking about what's the best setup for a chair, having some sort of light. Um, so this can be a desk lamp, this can be natural light. Um, but trying to think about, you know, think for yourself, what is helpful for me working and, you know, you know, yourself working from home or what you've done in the office previously or what's worked for your child um, is really important. And then also some sort of organizational system can be really helpful, especially with um, the organization and executive function. Um, so if your child is going into school, I think it's really important to think about a way for you to have their environment at home be as similar as possible to how it is at school. So if your child has a folder that, you know, they have at, you know, a section for to bring home, a section to bring to school, having a place for that folder when they are home. If you have a high school student and they have, you know, a color coordinated system for each class, um, or helping your child set that up so that when they're home, they know where all their materials are. Um, so everything should really have a place. Uh, and I think it can be really helpful if you're your child does have difficulties keeping things organized to have to set it up in a way that it is done in a way that it should be. So what is acceptable um, to use. So that could be like their computers in a certain space, they have their materials in a certain space. Um, and then taking a picture of that can even be a great idea and having a checklist where every morning they look through and say like, do I have all the materials I need? And then at the end of every day, putting things back um, and having a picture there of what the space looks like can be helpful. Um, so those are just some quick ideas. I, I also like to think backwards. Uh, and what I mean by this is, I'm sure there's been challenges previously in different settings or at school. So let's think about those challenges and try to come up with a way to support them rather for them to just continue to happen. Um, so, if there's always a difficulty with math because they don't have the right paper or they need graph paper and they never have it, you know, when you notice the problem, let's think backwards and plan for the next time. Um, and then also tools to help support. So in schools, there's a lot of different learning tools. So for younger kids, there's often manipulatives, meaning like little blocks or different pieces to help them with math. And this may be something schools may send to you, it may be something you want to get on your own, but I think that having the tools to support your child um, is going to help them. You know, we have to think about they're in a new environment, um, they're learning things for the first time, um, and how can we support them? So those tools can include pencils, graph paper, a calculator, and then they can get even more supportive or, or more complicated. So for example, if a child, um, is receiving special education services or has a disability with reading, there are a lot of technologies available to add to your child's computer to help support them. Um, for example, you know, it's always important to consult with the school um, to see what's helpful to them. Um, but even just if a child has difficulty reading, they can have applications that read items to them, especially if it's not in an area of reading comprehension, um, or if they're able to use a calculator, having them have a calculator. Um, sometimes there can be simple tools um, that can help support them with learning. And again, it's important to consult with the school or teacher to see um, what's acceptable, um, like what's typical at school, what's acceptable at home, and, and, and working as, as a partnership. Uh, with the school. Um, next, I'm going to talk about routines. So routines are really, really important and help people across the lifespan. When we have this structure, that can equal stability. So if we think back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this idea of like safety and security um, with the change because of the pandemic, there's many, many changes. So 
this is even more of a need to have a structure and routine and stability. And it likely will make um, other people's lives easier because everyone knows what's to be expected. So routines create these expectations and predictability, and they also can reduce the need to ask questions or give commands. So if you think about a child or adolescent, all day they're being told what to do. And if we are able to have a routine where they know what's expected and it's predictable, um, it's less likely we're gonna get into those um, difficult conversations or repeating ourselves a million times than asking for something. If there is this idea of a routine and expectation. Um, in general, routines help with confidence and independence. Um, they can lead to greater self-control because kids are able to lear learn like a balance. Um, so like a really quick example is this idea of work and play. Um, so if there's something that a kid really doesn't enjoy doing or that's more difficult, having something after it that's more enjoyable can be helpful. So this idea of, you know, once I complete my homework, then I can play a game um, can be used across many different settings. Um, so if there ever is something that, um, is less preferred, it's better to have something preferred after and have that plan of once you do this, then you're able to do something that you prefer. And this can help because your child or adolescent can learn like a balance between this idea of work and play and being able to have fun once we're able to do the things that we need to do or are expected of us. Um, and often having routines can result in reducing stress. Um, I'm sure it's a lot of people have experienced stress with all the changes in the pandemic. So again, these routines are even more important, especially with all the different changes that are happening. Um, and even if we're not able, able to have a set structure, if we have regular routines, um, kids are better able to adjust when you do, when they, when something else comes up, if there's just constantly changes, it's hard for anyone to get comfortable. I know, you know, for myself that it can be difficult if everything's changing all the time. So having a set routine or structure can be really helpful. And then, um, you know, we do need to have that flexibility, um, but starting with that routine and having structure can be really helpful. So I wanted to speak a little bit about modeling behavior. Um, so this is really like showing a child um, what, what to do or what we're doing. Um, so this really um, comes into play relating to social learning theory, which is the idea that people learn by observing and seeing effects. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that behavior will change. So just because you um, show, model some sort of behavior, or show a child how to do something or adolescent, doesn't mean that they necessarily will do it, um, but this is part of the process and can be really helpful. Um, so, it's, it's showing, but I also think a large piece that can be helpful uh, for children and adolescents is narrating the process. So that's really verbally expressing what you're doing while you're doing it. And the, you know, the thought process that's going on in my mind, a child can't really understand that. They just see the action. So this narration can be really helpful. Um, and it can help a child just in setting up the learning environment or with emotion regulation, you know, a quick example is, you know, when you're done with work or the end of the school day, talking about sort of what's going on um, and saying, you know, hey, how are you doing? Listening, validating their experience. And then when they ask you how you're doing, being honest and we never want to overburden children and uh, tell them everything that's happening, but it's important to label how we're feeling and if they can clearly see if we're sad or distressed, um, labeling that and then also talking about what you're gonna do to help that. Um, so a really easy example is, you know, I'm really stressed today uh, because it was a long day at work. So I'm gonna take a walk after, after work today. I'm gonna go for a walk. Do you wanna come with me? Um, or if you're really frustrated saying, hey, I need a break. For two minutes, I'm going to be right back. And then after you take the break, talking about sort of what you did, you know, I took three deep breaths, I got a drink of cold water. So really talking about um, what you did in that moment and narrating that can be super, super helpful uh, for a child to see. And it lets them know that it's okay to do these things and that 
it's helpful. Um, and the last um, idea I have as far as how to support learning and coping is explicit skill building. So I think um, just like in academic subjects, learning skills and emotion regulation may need to be explicitly taught. Um, so what do I mean by that? In schools, uh, a lot of kids get support for the typical academic subjects. And if you're having difficulty with something, oftentimes teachers will give you extra support or extra help. Um, the same applies for learning skills, emotion regulation, this executive functioning skills. So there's a lot of different ways we can do that. Um, again, I spoke about the narration. You can also just provide options of how the child may be feeling. So if you notice that your child is feeling sad or maybe angry, you could offer that as an answer. Oftentimes, even if you don't get it right, they will come back to you and say, actually, no, I'm mad about this or um, no, that's wrong. I'm feeling this way. Um, so even if it's not the correct emotion, just labeling that for them can be super helpful. Um, and this explicit teaching can also come into play when learning about coping skills. So there's a wide variety of coping skills and I'm gonna offer you some resources at the end, but you know, just taking a deep breath, taking a break, um, getting a drink of cold water. These are simple um, coping skills that we can teach children. And I think it's really important to, to teach these skills when uh, the child or adolescent is calm. If you try to do this when they're agitated or upset or dysregulated, it's not really gonna work. Um, so it's really important to practice these skills just like we would um, the analogy that comes to mind i think is with sports so if there is a specific skill or something that you're going to do we're not going to not try it until we're playing a game or something competitive we're going to try it during practice and we're going to maybe fail at it a couple times it's not going to work we're going to figure out what works and how we're coordinated to make it happen so that we're able to use it at game time i think this really relates to with children we don't want to wait till they're having a really difficult time to be like hey why don't you take a deep breath that's not really going to work. If they practice it when they're calm, um, they'll be better able to bring up that skill and utilize it in the moment. So I wanted to talk about where to go next. Of course, feel free to ask any questions um, and I'll be sure to try my best to get answers to them. But executive function and emotion regulation support can happen at school and at home. Um, so it's not, it, it's something that's really important and needs to happen in schools and also can be at home. New York State mandates social emotional learning. Um, so I think it's important to reach out to uh, schools, teachers, uh, guidance counselors, social workers, and asking what does that look like uh, in your child's school to help support that. Um, in school mental health resources can also provide referrals or recommendations. And then when and where to get extra support. So I like to think about um, having a toolbox. So uh, a bunch of different skills or things you can try with a child. Um, when you've tried and exhausted all those tools, it, it may be important to look into identifying other options. Um, and then also if your child's having difficulty in at least one setting, um, that's maybe a time that you need to get more support. Um, and may need to seek like outpatient therapy or, and or supports in school, depending on the need. Two really great resources, um, I think, that you should go look at if you want to learn more, um, I found to be super helpful uh, for more executive function. The Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University has some really great resources. Basically, um, they have a whole section on practicing executive functioning skills, and they have guides by age group from ages six months all the way through adolescence. Um, it's really, really wonderful. And then the second piece that's more about regulation, it, it does focus on emotion regulation, um, and it's called the zones of regulation. And it's designed to foster self-regulation and emotional control. Um, it goes into 
emotions and different zones that a child may be in, and then also talks about different coping skills to use in each of those zones. Um, oftentimes the curriculum is used with providers and teachers, but it can be used at home as well. Um, and it's, it's quite affordable and, you know, you can read through it and implement it. Um, it's designed for, yeah, teachers and providers to just read through and be able to implement uh, with children and adolescents. Um, so that is where I end my presentation. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share. All right. All right. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, well, thanks so much, Dr. Rossi. And um, yeah, it's just it's like you're having to give kind of parents a crash course and things that mm -hmm. teachers have, have learned, right? It's like, yeah. So we we do have a couple of questions. Um, so someone has asked, can you please touch on a teenage school refusal, some strategies and, and tools? That's really great. Um, so school refusal can definitely be challenging. Um, I think in all of my work, it's really important to involve the teen or child in the process and in the plan in order to support them returning to school. Um, so their voice is just as important or more important because if we don't have the buy-in from the teenager, we can't make them go to school. There's, you know, I think that's usually that's the first thing when I meet with a teenager is I say like, I can't make, you know, I can't make you do anything, but these are things that need to happen. How can we get to that place. Um, so for teenagers, it's really important to get that buy-in. And then I think really understanding why they're refusing to go to school. There's a lot of different reasons. Um, there can be academic reasons. Um, you know, as kids get older, if they're having difficulty, ac difficulty with academics, um, there's also the social stigma that goes along with that. Say they're having difficulty reading, they're not gonna wanna go to class. Um, their refusal may be related to sort of their internal state. They may be depressed or anxious. Um, so I think kind of understanding what's going on. And then also to sort of go back to that zone of proximal development. Um, you know, if if a teen is hasn't been going to school for a month, we, sh we're, we can't really expect them to just all of a sudden go to school full time. We have to think about what's important, where do they start and really collaborate with the school um, and if and or if they have an outside provider. Um, but it can definitely be challenging with teens. And I think that that's the buy in again is really, really important. And, you know, if it, if a child's really missing out academically um, because of the school ref refusal, I mean, working with the school is the first step. And then if they do need extra support, that may be a time when you consider getting additional special education supports depending on you know what the needs of the teen is at that time um i would say I'm trying to think of different strategies or tools yeah i think i think coming up with the plan together and then um thinking about what's important to that to the teen so it might be important for them to spend time with their friends or play video games. And so it's like setting expectations and providing different like incentives or rewards for, for meeting those demands. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you do look to that external motivation if, if you have to, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. I, yeah. Ideally internal motivation would be great, but it's not there. Probably the kids are refusing to go to school. So we might have to rely on. So those outside external motivators. When, um, I mean, I guess, have you seen in, in your practice situations where like, you know, you say, okay, it's not working and someone does need to go to like a more supportive environment or and, like what just happens if they, you know, there's no buy-in, not going, we've tried everything. Is there at some point a recommendation for something more, you know, formal? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, it's always ideal for a a child to be in what people call like the least restrictive environment, meaning um, going, you know, starting from just in a general education classroom all the way to maybe a specialized school to more of an intensive program. Um, I think it's important to try outside supports first in your current environment, um, but sometimes it's just not a good fit for the child and um, thinking about a school that can better support their needs. Um, 
it, it can be helpful possibly to start the special education pro process and requesting an evaluation. Um, however, with a teenager and they're needing credits to graduate high school, that may be something where you consider um, maybe a different high school placement or a different um, type of school for a period of time. So that could be, you know, just trying to find the right fit for that child or a more specialized or um, school that can meet their needs either academically or social emotionally. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want a child to miss several months of school without attending at all. That would be a huge red flag and sign that something's not right and something needs to change. Um, but if they're starting to make progress, you know, say they're attending half days for, you know, a couple weeks, that's, that sounds positive. So it's all, it's all relative, but yeah, I wouldn't, I would, I would start with the outside supports if that's not working, requesting an evaluation and or considering maybe a more supportive school in some mm -hmm. capacity. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could actually touch upon that evaluation process. So um, if, if a parent requests an evaluation with the school district, there's different timelines, there's different rules. Um, I, I see the school districts doing evaluations, but sometimes I see families seeking um, external um, educational evaluations. And I know you do some of those uh, yourself. Mm -hmm. could, could you maybe just talk a little bit about like when someone would seek an external one and like what that looks like? And I think I, yeah. I'd be curious. Okay. So, I mean, just to, all, all parents have a right to request an evaluation um, and it's recommended to do it in writing. Um, and once you turn that in, um, there is a timeline that the school district needs to follow um, due to educational law. So I think it's important to look into that and where you are, it, it's, you're entitled to that um, for your child. Um, they may try to dissuade you and say, your child doesn't need this, but if you write the letter, you know, you're, they are required to support that evaluation. So I think that's a really important piece. Um, so sometimes you get that evaluation in school and they say they don't need services or it's just not working or maybe you don't trust the school or they're really not meeting their needs and then you can seek an outside evaluation. Um, so you still will need to go, if you want supports in your school, you still will need to go through the special education process. Um, but getting an outside evaluation, um, it's a little bit different. So oftentimes in schools, they can do assessments, but they don't provide diagnoses or explicit recommendations. It's more to see if your child is eligible for special education services. Um, so say they do the evaluation, they find out they have a really big challenge in reading, they might be like, okay, we can provide support for reading. But say your child maybe has um, additional difficulties or it's more complicated, um, you can seek an outside evaluation. Uh, they typically are more intensive and the reports can be more detailed and offer more explicit recommendations. So um, when I do evaluations, I recommend what the parent can do, what teacher can do, uh, what type of class size or supports they may need. And then this report can be brought to the school and be part of the special education process to um, help a child get their needs met. Um, and it also includes diagnoses, which um, it can be hard to sort of want to go down that road, but unfortunately in the system we're in, sometimes you do need a diagnosis in order to get supports. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be uh, useful in being able to get those supports in your child's school or finding another school that can meet their needs. Right, and what, what's the difference between a neuropsych test and the, the educational testing? Yeah, so there's a lot of different types of testing. Um, so I would say psychoeducational testing involves a cognitive component, which is your sort of overall thinking abilities, um, and then typically focuses more on academics, so reading, writing, and math. And then sometimes there's a social emotional component. Um, you might fill out a self-report sort of about your child's mood and how they're doing. Um, that is, a little less intensive. A neuropsychological report is completed by a psychologist who specializes in the area of um, neuropsychology, 
um, and they typically they do some of the same assessments as what's in the psychoeducational, but it's often more intensive, and it gets more to sort of like the executive functioning skills we spoke about earlier um, and learning profiles. Um, and it's just, it's generally just more intensive, um, I would say overall. Typic Sorry, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, typically you would need to, you would need a neuropsych if your child was needing like a private placement or um, something more intensive. So. A neuropsych isn't usually the first thing that you would go to, but say, uh, you know, if they've been getting supports, they have an, an individualized education plan in school, they've gotten a psychoed through school or outside, and there's still difficulty, this neuropsych report goes into more detail about how your child thinks, how they um, organize information in their mind and can get more at what is, what is difficult for them and how to support. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks. So um, I, I wanted to ask a question about uh, something I saw um, kind of viral on the internet, a, a story this, this week um, about mm -hmm. a mom um, who whose child was doing, I think an adolescent child was doing remote learning um, and um, gave the child a snack in the middle of um, the learning and the teacher kind of you know, uh, scolded the, the mom and there's been a lot, kind of a lot of people sort of saying, hey, you know, let, let's let that go. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of what, what would you say, I guess, both the kind of teachers as well as parents trying to juggle this remote learning thing about, you know, things like that, that it might be like weird if they were in school to get a snack. Is that? Yeah, yeah. it can be, it can definitely be difficult. I think um, at the end of the day, we all have to remember that this is new and that also generally like everyone is trying to do the best that they can with what they have. And most every teacher and every parent that I speak to has good intentions and wants to just support that child. Um, we may go about it in different ways. We may not always agree what that looks like, but I think that's something always to keep in the back of our mind when we see something um, and trying not to jump to conclusions that, um, and or accuse people of, you know, trying to do the wrong thing or getting someone in trouble. I think it's important to think about the situation and also recognize that um, it's a huge shift for a teacher to be in the home and the same goes vice versa for, um, you know, a student to be in your home if you're a teacher and you're teaching from home. So there are a lot of changes and boundaries and I think it's, it involves flexibility on both parts. And I think oftentimes, you can come up with a compromise. So sort of understanding what the school rules are and sort of the rules at the home and having those conversations with teachers and administrators. Um, oftentimes teachers are just implementing what the rules are that were told to them or that were in school. So sometimes like in the moment saying like, okay, and then following up on that later, I think is really, really important. Um, but we, you know, as a, as a teacher, you really can't control what's happening at the student's home and what the parents are doing. And so it's like, there's a lot of limitations there. Um, at the same time, I understand not wanting to be a distraction. So I think it's all about compromise and uh, sort of finding out what works best. Um, yeah. You know, everyone's just trying to, to have their kids learn as much as possible in the circumstances. And right. it's, it's tricky. Very, sort of un tricky. uncharted waters. I've seen things about like dress codes. It's like, well, they're at home, yes. but there's obviously, I think as a therapist, we know like uh -huh. we would be, it would be weird if like a patient showed up to one of our sessions, like in a bathing suit or something, but there is like a lot less formality than if they were coming into the office. Yeah. And I think um, it can be, you know, sometimes rules are, don't make sense or they're just there but oftentimes it can be helpful for a child to you know if they do have a uniform it can be helpful for them to wear it during class because then they know when I have this on I'm in school mm -hmm. versus you know I don't I when I wake up I change my clothes even if I don't need to I could still wear my clothes that I slept in but it's like this change in routine even though I'm in the same place it's sort of um trying to approximate those changes that happen pre-pandemic and how do we implement them now? And right. yeah, it's challenging. 
I actually wonder, I don't know if schools that have uniforms, if they're having kids wear them, but that kind of would make sense because if they're going to create that environment, like take that picture of the learning environment, you'd think mm -hmm. they would be including that, uh, <laughs> that attire yeah. as well. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, we also got a question um, kind of related to school refusal, but in the COVID era, where uh -huh. school refusal is turning off the Zoom camera um, and not participating and, and sort of, you know, what tips would you have for, you know, for if a, if a teacher has a student like refusing to turn on the camera? Yeah, so I think there's different levels with refusing and uh, participation. So I think it's like sort of assessing um, where this is happening. So uh, oftentimes when something happens in one classroom, we assume it's happening in all classrooms. And so I think it's really um, with any behavior or challenges sort of assessing, is this happening in just one setting, multiple settings? Is it a specific teacher, a specific class? Mm -hmm. Is it maybe only when they're doing at home learning at their dad's house or their mom's house or mm -hmm. when grandma's home? You know, so I think it's really understanding the complexities of it. Um, and I think the first step is asking the child, what's up with that? Just having a open, frank conversation. Um, I know like some simple tricks is in Zoom, you can also hide your face. So some kids don't like to see their face while they're in school. So they can actually hide their own face. So they're not like looking at themselves the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, that can be helpful. I also like to think about it in, um, in steps. So like, the first step is having them just join the class. The second step would be participation in some capacity. So that could be turning their screen on. That could be chatting in the chat with the teacher. Mm -hmm. um, it could be completing the work separately and then building from there. Um, in Zoom, there's breakout rooms. So if the teacher is able to um, have time to talk to that student individually, that could be helpful. Um, and it may need to be a a conversation between the teacher, the parent, and the child to sort of brainstorm how can we how can we make this work? Um, right. Because you know some schools do have a rule: in order to be counted, you have to be like your picture, your face has to be on screen, or your right. your Zoom camera has to be on. And so, how do we be flexible but also um, support the student to to meet the demands of the environment? Right. I wonder too, if some children are, are concerned about like their surroundings and, you know, it's like all of a sudden everyone's going to see your home and that's very different than when a kid goes to school and there's some kind of equalization, right, of, of that in the classroom. Oh, definitely. And I mean, you are, in, I mean, in Zoom, you're able to change your background. So that's something sure. that some kids can do. They can just change the background. Mm -hmm. But again, a lot of times their siblings at home, they're embarrassed of their brother running in the background or you know there's yep. the zoom happens. the zoom bombing toddler yep yes. <laughs> I'm familiar with that yes, yes. So, so yeah I mean it, it is really tricky and it could be as simple as finding a different space for them to learn or getting noise canceling headphones like there's a lot of different um solutions but it's really asking the child what's going on and trying to figure that out because we can guess and we can provide solutions but if we don't know what's actually going on, right. we can't really, really support them in that way. So taking that curious stance, is, it seems like so important with any type of school related behavior. Oh, definitely. And, and I mean, I think also validating how they're feeling. So really getting to how they're feeling when they turn the camera off, when the teacher calls them out for not having the camera on and you know, validating this is hard and this is new and absolutely it's it's okay that's it's, yeah. it's hard it's okay i think and mm -hmm. i think that's probably a great a great point to end um so i just want to thank everyone for attending um if anyone's interested in, in booking a consultation with Dr. Rossi um, for therapy or educational testing or any, any of our other services, um, head over to our website. You can put in an inquiry there. Um, also follow us on social media so you can learn about upcoming uh, Grand Street Rounds. And uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us and hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>